good morning, everyone. My brothers and sisters out there. Uh, again, I'm so glad that you're able to join us this week for our worship service. This is the Lord's day, and this is the day the Lord has made. And we want to do our best to rejoice and be glad in it. I hope you've had a good week. Uh, school here at Locust Grove has started, and lots of other places it started as well. And that comes with all kinds of uh, new challenges and opportunities and uh, anxieties uh, and things to uh, good things to anticipate as well. Uh, so I, I hope that your week has been a good week, and I hope that you're ready to worship. Let's go ahead and, and pray the Lord's Prayer together. I appreciate Marion so much uh, week after week uh, playing so beautifully for us. I appreciate uh, Les leading our music and um, sharing the hymn stories. We'll be sharing another one uh, here in just a moment. And I appreciate the Gortneys, uh, Darren and Whitney and uh, Ezra and Levi, who uh, read scripture for us this morning from Psalm 100 and then from the book of Revelation, verse uh, chapter 4. So um, thankful for all of those who help to um, put together the service to put on YouTube so that you all who are not able to be here with us, or maybe you live somewhere else, or maybe you have another church. Whatever your circumstance, I'm glad. I'm thankful for the people who, who help us uh, to put this together. Um, all right, well, let's pray together. If you have an opportunity, you can. Someone close enough to you there, and they don't mind. <laughs> if you would, uh, would like to take someone's hand, put your hand on somebody's shoulder, um, it's always good to be reminded that we're not alone. There are lots of one another passages in the New Testament, lots of them. Uh, forgive one another, uh, bear one another's burdens, pray for one another, encourage one another, all kinds of one another passages. And uh, it's, so, it's so important that we remember that we're not alone uh, in this world. And I hope that you don't feel alone today. Um, the Lord is with us and of course, anytime, anytime you can reach out to us at the end of each service uh, that we put on YouTube, my personal cell number is, uh, is there listed and you're welcome to call me anytime. So, all right, well, let's pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lead on, O King Eternal is a regal prayer that has been sung at graduations around the world every year since 1887 when Ernest Shirtliff wrote it for his own graduation. He was a native of Boston and a graduate of Harvard. And at 26, he was a student at Andover Theological Seminary when he envisioned his fellow seminarians marching for their diplomas, singing a great prayer for God's guidance on the rest of life. Selecting a famous tune called Lancashire, Ernest wrote words as regal as the music, and thus a great tradition was born. Now, let's be honest, some of our great hymns haven't aged well in this time of political uh, correctness. They can be seen as nationalistic and militant and even downright violent. But uh, hymns can't be understood after reading or singing only a single stanza. And many might be tempted to write this song off as just another 19th century militant hymn. After all, the first verse talks about the day of March and fields of conquest and lifting our battle song. But the second verse is just as powerful and provides some perspective Singers arrive enthusiastically to the battlefield in the first stanza only to find they will not be wielding loud clashing swords or listening to the roll of stirring drums. 
But instead, um, holiness will whisper the sweet amen of peace. And they will be doing battle using deeds of love and mercy. Ernest went on to be ordained a congregational minister and to hold pastorates in Massachusetts, Minnesota, and California. In 1905, he organized a church in Frankfurt, Germany. He and his wife worked tirelessly with European students. When World War I broke out, Ernest labored to exhaustion in relief ministries, feeding the poor and the refugees. He died in Paris in 1917 during the Great War. His life was the embodiment of his hymn, yet nothing he did was as enduring to history as that hymn written at age 26. Who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, 
The twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. The title of the message is Power, Politics, and Providence. And the passage is John 18, 28 through 19, 16. In this story, we see two men face to face. One of them is Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect, the Roman governor. The other is Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus has just been dragged before Pilate by the Jewish religious authorities. They want Jesus crucified. They want him killed immediately. And so they brought him to Pilate to attempt to get Pilate to pronounce the death sentence upon him and have him crucified. We're going to concentrate our attention on chapter 19 verses 9 through 11. And I hope that we will be able to see in this passage how a number of the themes that John has been developing in the gospel all come together here in this text. So John chapter 19, verse 9 through 11. And Pilate went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Power is the subject. Humans have always been obsessed with it. We don't want to feel powerless, so we get horsepower and firepower. We want to have brain power. We overpower others with manpower and air power because we are powerhouse superpower. We're obsessed with power. And Pilate says to Jesus, don't you understand that I have absolute power over you, the power to free you or the power to crucify you? I possess the only thing that matters here, and that is power. Well, maybe Pilate is right. You look at this scene, and the first thing that you notice is the place that Pilate was living. This palace was a place of power, obviously the enormous marble stones, the porticos, the porches, the gardens, the pools, the silver and the gold, and all of this opulence in this palace just shouted power. Also Pilate's position, Pilate was the Roman prefect, the governor of Palestine. He was appointed there by Tiberius Caesar himself, who was the most powerful man in the entire world at the time. So Pilate then possessed what we call the imperium, that is the power to do just about anything he wanted to do. That would be nice, wouldn't it, to have that sort of power? Well, Pilate had it. Also Pilate's past, Pilate knew how to use this vast power to get things done, whatever he wanted done. He had a reputation for cruelty. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 13, verse 1, it says that Pilate mingled the blood of the worshipers, the Galilean worshipers, with their sacrifices. It seems that this happened at another Passover. The story here is from one particular Passover. This is probably from another one when the worshipers were at the temple offering their sacrifices. Pilate evidently sent his henchmen in and murdered some of them so that their blood was spilled as these worshipers were slaughtering their own sacrifices. So Pilate was a powerful man who had the power of Rome behind him. And he reminds Jesus that he has the absolute power over Jesus. It was early that Friday morning. Pilate has already had Jesus flogged, put a crown of thorns upon his head, put a purple, a purple robe, shrouded him with it. He had Jesus' face slapped, beaten. And Jesus stands, I want you to imagine Jesus standing before Pilate in this lavish palace before this powerful man having been mocked, accused, insulted, and is now bleeding. Well, finally, Pilate's presentation 
During this trial, Pilate goes in and out of this palace a number of times, at least four times. He goes out from Jesus to talk to the Jewish authorities, Jesus' accusers, and then back in to talk to Jesus, back and forth, back and forth a number of times. So Pilate in chapter 19, verse 4, goes out again. And he says to them, I'm bringing him out to you, but I want you to know that I find no basis for a charge against him. Pilate actually says this three times in this passage, three witnesses from his own lips that Jesus is innocent. Yet still, he has Jesus led out before the mob. Jesus wearing crown of thorns, purple robe. And Pilate says famously, behold the man, or here is the man. And this sight of Jesus' blood and how he had been abused caused their pulse to quicken. And it caused their heart to stop pounding and their eyes to brighten. And they began to cry out, yes, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate had asked Jesus, chapter 18, verse 33 and 37, if he was the king of the Jews. And now Pilate presents Jesus in a mockery as the king with the crown of thorns, the purple robe, mocking Jesus. Why does he use this particular phrase, here is the man? Well, I think John recording it, the author of this gospel, wants us to remember another time when these exact same words were spoken. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, Israel is looking for its first king and God sends Samuel and God says to Samuel, I will show you who the king will be. And we pick up when the Bible says, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man whom I have chosen. It is he who shall rule over my people Israel. God says, here is the man. Pilate speaks these same words when he says, here is the man and points to this beaten and bloody, crowned and robed in mockery. And yet, it is true. This is the man. This is the one that God has appointed to rule over his people. This one. Now I've described to you Pilate's place, his position, his past, and his presentation of Jesus to the mob. Well, what about this other man called Jesus, the other man in the conversation? Well, Pilate asks Jesus, where do you come from? This is an important question in the Gospel of John that's developed throughout the unfolding of the story. In chapter 8, verse 23, Jesus said to them, You are from below, but I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Chapter 7, verse 27, 28 we know where this man comes from. When uh, the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed, you know me, do you? You think you know me? Do you really know where I come from? Chapter 8, verse 14, Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness to myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I've come from and where I'm going. Well, where did Jesus come from? He knew where he had come from. He had told others where he had come from, but he will not tell Pilate. It's interesting. Pilate asks, where do you come from? And Jesus doesn't answer him at all. John points out that he was silent. And this is in fulfillment of Isaiah 53, verse 7, that Jesus was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears are silent, is silent. So he uttered not a word. Now, Pilate this perturbs Pilate. He's not used to interrogating someone and not getting an answer in return. And so he flexes his imperial muscles and he says, Do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize? Don't you understand that I have the power to free you or to crucify you? Pilate knows that the future, that the destiny of this pathetic, though innocent and harmless Jewish man lay in Pilate's powerful hands. You better speak up before it's too late because I possess the power. And so Jesus, draped in humiliating apparel, bloody and beaten within this opulent palace and before powerful Pilate, 
says, you have no power over me, not any, except what has been given to you from above. Do you like it when your uh, pastor preaches politics? Most people say no, but the fact is this passage, if we pay close attention, is profoundly political. And if you preach the Bible, you cannot escape preaching politics. And Jesus is standing before Pilate, putting politics in its place, putting politics in its place. This is a profoundly political passage. Here's Jesus before the government authority. Pilate possesses political power. Jesus tells him where it comes from. And it's the same place that all political power from all times and all places and all personal power comes from today too. Same place. It's interesting that Pilate asks Jesus where he comes from. Jesus also told Pilate, chapter 18, verse 36, my kingdom is not from this world. My kingdom is from another place. Well, which place? Well, his kingdom is from above. So Jesus says he comes from above. He says his kingdom is from above. And he says that the power that Pilate has, this political power that Pilate has, also comes from the same place, from above. So the gospel teaches us not only about the place of Jesus, but also the power. John the Baptist understood this. He said in chapter 3, verse 27 and following, a person, this sounds like Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. John says, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You can only have what has been given to you from heaven, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. He says, what do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, why do you talk about it? Why do you brag about it as though you had not received? In other words, he says, you have nothing, nothing good except what you have received from above. John goes on to say, verse 28, you yourselves can testify that I said, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. He must increase. He must become greater. I must decrease. or I must become less. Verse 31, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He says Jesus is from heaven and he's above everybody. And the father loves the son and has placed all things into his hands. Jesus is the Messiah who is above all. He's from above. He's from heaven. And the father of heaven has placed all things. That leaves absolutely nothing, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. Nothing in subjection to Jesus. Well, which things are in the hands of this one who stands before Pilate? Well, all things, all things. The gospel begins by affirming something very similar to this. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So I want you to consider Jesus standing here before Pilate, Pilate saying, I have the power over you, that every atom in the physical body of Pilate, every molecule and particle making up the pilot, the body of Pontius Pilate at that very moment, all of them were made by Jesus. And Pilate, in fact, was being held together by Jesus at that exact moment. I mentioned a moment ago, Pilate's position, Roman prefect, and this is Pilate's composition, that he is actually composed, made up of the very particles that Jesus, the one who stood before him, had created. Now, Jesus had already spoken plainly about what was happening at this very moment. John chapter 10, Jesus says, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Now underline this, John, 7, John 10, 17 and 18. I have the power, same word that Pilate uses. I have the power, the authority to lay it down. And I have the power, authority 
to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Pilate says, don't you know I have the power to crucify you? No. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I alone have the power, the authority to lay it down and to take it up again, which he will do in just a few days when the tomb is empty. Next, the position of Jesus. Even though Jesus had been dragged before Pilate as an accused defendant, the fact is Jesus was at that very moment the judge of Pilate and the judge of the Jewish authorities. Did you notice in verse 11 that Jesus pronounces judgment? He says, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. You're guilty of sin, Pilate, but the one who handed me over is guilty of a greater sin because they should have known better. Jesus has just pronounced judgment on Pilate and on the Jewish authorities. Jesus talks about this in chapter 5, verse 26 and 27. For as the Father has given the Son authority to execute judgment, because he's the Son of Man. Jesus says that the Father above has given the Son, which is Jesus, the authority to execute judgment. This has also come to him from above. So who is this man standing before this powerful Pontius Pilate? Well, he is not only Pilate's creator, but he is also Pilate's judge. Jesus is on trial, everyone believes, but he's actually the judge. Not only that, but he's also a witness. If we look back in chapter 18, and I want you to see also the purpose of Jesus. Earlier in this conversation, Pilate said, you're a king then? Is that what you are? And Pilate is concerned only with the things that have to do with power. He's concerned about power. Are you a king? Are you a rival to Caesar? Are you a rival to my power? This is his concern. But notice that Jesus answer is concerned with something different than that. Jesus answered, yes, you say I'm the king. But in fact, chapter 18, verse 37, in fact, for this reason, I was born for this reason. I came into the world. So two purpose clauses for this reason. I was born and came into this world. Well, what is that? To testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Pilate hears this and he famously answers, what is truth? And then he turns around immediately and walks away and leaves Jesus behind. He doesn't want to have a conversation about the truth. Now, Jesus does not say that he's not the king, but he changes the subject. Now, notice this is important. Jesus changes the subject of the conversation from power to truth. He has come into the world from above to be a witness to the truth. And this is emphatic, this twofold introduction. For this reason I was born, for this reason I came into the world. Nowhere else in the Gospel of John where he gives a number of mission statements, for this reason I came. There's nowhere else where he says this twice to emphasize the importance of this statement. So Jesus comes into this scene as the accused and on trial defendant. Instead, he is a witness to the truth as a central reason for his coming. He is a witness. So first he's the defendant and a witness, and now he is the judge who hands down the judgment both on Pilate and on those for whom the sin was greater. So here's the question in this passage. What is more important, power or truth? I mean, really, let, let's get real. Everybody knows power is the most important thing. Truth is just a tool that can be twisted in order to get more power, right? For Pilate and for many people in our world, truth is whatever the people who have the power say it is. That is the definition of truth. Whatever the people who have the power say it is. That's what it is. Have you noticed many political ads lately, maybe on your television, your Facebook feed, YouTube, whatever. Have you heard the spin room? Have you heard of the spin room? You know what that is? Why all these things? Well, this is Pilate's philosophy as well. Truth. <laughs> what is truth? What relevance 
does that have? He has no interest in the subject. That's why he turns and walks away. Truth, honesty, integrity, all these things are irrelevant. Turns around and leaves. What has truth got to do with anything? I don't think Pilate was raising a philosophical question. This is merely a practical consideration. We use information to gain power. That, that, that's all. But we have heard Jesus say, chapter 14, I am the truth. Pilate is speaking to the very incarnation, the embodiment of truth. Truth is in the flesh. And Pilate is saying, what does truth have to do with anything? Jesus says, yes, I, I am the king, but actually and centrally, I am a witness to the truth. Jesus has come to reveal God. Jesus has come as a revelation. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus actually here in this passage subordinates power to truth. He says, truth is why I've come. Truth is why I've come from above and I've come to reveal God and the truth to the world. And the central act of revelation of God, the revelation of God is going to happen here very quickly as Jesus is led away to the cross and as Jesus hangs on the cross, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Jesus hangs upon the cross as the final and fullest revelation of the truth of God, that God is love, that God's desire for the world is that the world might be saved. This is why he's come. In our world, people will twist truth beyond all recognition in order to get hold of and hold on to power. People will deny the truth, ignore the truth, turn their backs on the truth and believe things like this. Only a fool tells the truth if it costs him power. Because finally, power is the only thing that matters. What about this power that is so precious and important to Pilate? And so many people in our world. Well, Jesus says that God Almighty has temporarily permitted Pilate to possess it. In other words, Pontius Pilate has only the power that the providence of God has temporarily permitted. How should Christians think about power? Well, there is not a single solitary particle outside of God's providence. There is not an atom in the universe that is outside of the providence of God. God is sovereign and he has control over the universe that he has created. In the entire universe, there is not a single rogue molecule running wild. God is the source of power and all authority. God permits people to possess power temporarily according to God's wise purposes. God is a sovereign, all-powerful, almighty God. And any power that any person or political institution might have, they only have it because God has permitted them to have it for a certain time. An allotted time they have been given. So what does Jesus say to Pilate about politics and power? He says, you only have what God has given you a little bit for a little amount of time and you'll be judged based on how you use it. It isn't yours, it's God's. And it is what he says to all of us, even the most powerful of us. Power we have is on loan and we won't have it long. And the only question is, how will you use it? Because you're gonna be judged for it. Are we going to use it to give life and to give hope and to give truth and to give peace and for the kingdom and for the name of Jesus? Or are we going to use the power influence we have to manipulate and to coerce and to win at all costs? The Bible says, Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. 
the world and all who live in it. Well, this psalm says not just the planet belongs to God, but the people who live on it belong to God as well. None of us belong to ourselves. The planet belongs to God, the people belong to God, and the power that God has given the people belongs to God alone as well. And so, watch this. Jesus said that he has come to build the kingdom. The growth of the kingdom of God is nothing more than the process of the king repossessing what has not been lost, but what has been on loan. God has lost nothing. We become lost by wandering away. But nothing has escaped the power of God. God has given, has allowed room and space for power and influence and wealth and possessions. The growth of the kingdom of God is a process of patient repossession through faithful service to Jesus. This is how it's regained. Not through a powerful grasping and grabbing, but through faithful service walking in the steps of Jesus. Edmund Burke Others followed in his footsteps by quoting this, but he said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil men is for good men to do nothing. You've heard that before, no doubt. Well, what is the something we must do? What did Burke have in mind? The only thing necessary for evil men to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Well, what is the something? Well, the something, according to the scriptures, according to Jesus, the something we must do very simple. Follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Take up our cross. Lay down our lives day after day after day. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, when he says, in view of God's mercy, present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable or your spiritual act of service. Pretty simple, right? Follow in Jesus' footsteps. It's not about grasping the power. It is about walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Thankful for the Gortneys. They read scripture for us. And um, they did a great job. And I'm thankful for them. I asked them to read a word of praise and a word of revelation from the book of Revelation for us. Revelation was written, actually, I believe, by the same person as the Gospel of John. Um, John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and also the book of Revelation. I want you to think about this for just a moment. The reading transported us with John to a place that is up above. Revelation 4.1, God says, Come up here, and I will show you the things to come. Into the throne room of God above to witness the worship of of the God of all glory, of all honor, of all power, the creator of all things. In chapter 5, just beyond what the Gortneys read, the book of Revelation continues in chapter 5 with the appearance of a book. And this book has seven seals upon it, keeping it closed. Well, this is the book of the destiny of all creation. What is going to happen in the days to come? And this book has all of this information revealed, but concealed and sealed up within it. It reveals what is to come, but there is great weeping in heaven because no one, they look in heaven and earth and under the earth, and no one is worthy to break the seals of this book and to open it and to reveal what is going to happen. But then in the midst of the weeping, an announcement of good news comes. Revelation 5, 5, and 6. Weep not, lo, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. John hears that there is a lion who, has, who is worthy to open the scrolls. But when he looks, he sees a, not a lion, but he sees a lamb that has been slain. But it is a lamb who is also conquered, and therefore he is worthy to open the scroll. So Jesus is the lion, this image of strength, 
who is worthy and able to open the book of destiny because he has conquered. Well, what does it mean to conquer? What does it look like to conquer? Imagine Jesus once again standing there before Pilate, this same Jesus that is described here in the book of Revelation. He has conquered through being crucified. He has conquered by laying down his life in love and allowing himself to be slain. In the book of Revelation, John tells the churches in chapters 2 and 3 not to be seduced by the power of Rome, not to take the, the way of Pilate, but to go the way of Jesus, not to be seduced by the power of empire, but to follow the Lamb who was slain and through faithfully following the Lamb in patient endurance, they will be victorious. They will conquer. At the end of each of the letters to the churches in chapters 2 and 3, and you will be victorious in this way by following in the footsteps of the lamb that was slain. This is what we see right here before Pilate. There's probably the same community to whom the book of Revelation was written, probably is the same group to whom the book of the gospel of John was written as well, living in Asia Minor, experiencing the persecution of the Roman Empire and the seduction of the Roman Empire. This passage would have been inc incredibly important for them. And it goes along well with the book of Revelation. That is a critique of Roman imperial power. So we see before Pilate, the one who shows us the way to be victorious, church. He's going to lay down his life. And in this way, he will conquer and be worthy. And finally, when all is said and done, it will be none other than the lamb that was slain. So we desperately need to see in these days the two ways that we see put on display between Pilate, who has been seduced by power, and Jesus, who laid down his life even for Pilate. So we must never sacrifice truth on the altar of power. People of faith, in fact, must be willing to lose power for the sake of truth and integrity and righteousness. Many believe and want us to believe that everything comes down to power, how to get it, how to hold on to it, because this is the thing that matters most. The entire world is just one great big power dynamic. Everything hinges on getting the power. That is why this disgusting mud pit fight for power, this despicable scrambling and fighting for power, no holds barred. Have you seen it? The lying, deceiving, insulting, dehumanizing, spinning, twisting, perverting. This is what politics looks like in a fallen world. This is what has always happened when power has been exalted over truth. Jesus refused to play this game all the way back at the very beginning of his ministry. This is what the devil was tempting him to do. He said, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you the power. I will give you all of these kingdoms. Just bow down before me. And Jesus refused. He says, no, the way of power in ruling in this way is not the way the victory will be won. I will not go around the cross to get the power. I will go through the cross. I will endure and bear the pain, death of the cross. And in this way, I will be victorious because this is the heart of God at the center of all things is a God who displays power by laying God's self down in self-sacrificial love, even for God's enemies. This is, what that's, this is what is at the center of all things, not power, but love. Now, of course, God has ordained the government. I'm not saying the government is irrelevant. Of course not. It has a function in God's fallen world. And governments can be better or worse. Politicians can be better or worse. And I thank God for godly politicians. Praise God if they stay godly after getting a taste of power. That seduction is so great. It's not an easy thing to do. But when and where and if it happens, I thank God for that. Well, as Jesus is taken away to be crucified, imagine in your mind's eye with me. Jesus is now, he's being led away from Pilate. Pilate has pronounced, yes, he will be crucified. What do I see as I look back behind Jesus? I see, in fact, poor, pitiful, 
pathetic Pilate. I don't see power. In your regal robes that one day soon will be moth-eaten, your authority of which you will soon be divested and stripped, your pathetic life as you live it out, chasing power, never being able to grasp. It's a sad scene. It's a sad sight. And there the Son of God who came to die for the sins of the world was right there for him. There was a way for Pilate to win. He could have won. Bow down. Pledge your allegiance to Jesus. Well, why would you ever want to do such a thing? That sounds like it's exactly the same thing. No, because this king, listen, this king would rather die than take your life. A king who would rather die for you than take your life from you. Even, the, even though you've done this to him. But Pilate would not. A few years ago, archaeologists in Caesarea found a stone. And this is not very high tech, but I'm going to try to show you here. This is a stone that was found in Caesarea. And you can only read part of it. The other part has been eroded away by time and who knows what else. The translation on that stone that I just showed you is to the divine August Tiberius. Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has dedicated this. Now, this is a stone that we have to show that Pilate was a prefect in Judea during the time of Jesus. Sometimes when I do funerals, either before or after we've gone to the, the cemetery, I'll walk around the cemetery and I'll look at the headstones and I don't know why that's an interesting thing to do, and I imagine what kind of a life this person lived, what was life like back then. Sometimes I come across some that time and the weather have made it such that you can't read it. You can see there are some markings there, but you can't see it very well, and you can't really see what it says. I imagine that this stone that has been found, I imagine this as Pilate's headstone. Pilate who pursued power and influence and authority mercilessly. This is what is left of him. This is what is left of his name. This stone of Pilate, eroded, weathered, mostly gone, accidentally discovered and stumbled onto 2,000 years after his death. Such is the destiny of all who choose to bow down before the Caesars of the world instead of Jesus. That's what happened to the name of Pilate. What about the name of Jesus? Well, you know, on this day and every day, the name of Jesus praised in heaven, praised on the earth. As a matter of fact, all around the earth on the Lord's day, people are raising their voices in joy and hope and in peace and in worship to our Lord and our Savior, our King of Kings, the Lamb who was slain, and so we continue to sing, lead on, O King eternal, till sin's fierce war shall cease and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, no, nor roll a stirring drum, but deeds of love and mercy, thy reign of peace shall come.
I hope that you've enjoyed the service. I hope that you've experienced the Lord's presence and I hope that you've been encouraged and blessed. And I want to leave you with a blessing as I do each week. And I say this blessing uh, from the bottom of my heart and I pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that the Lord would make his face to shine down upon you and be gracious unto you, that the Lord would lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen.